You may have heard the term carbon footprint, but did you know that chemicals like carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus actually cycle through our households every single day? Scientists from the Twin Cities Household Ecosystem Project are studying this phenomenon, which they call household flux, asking how the choices we make impact the pollutants in our environment. When we say flux, think of it as a flow. It's simply a movement of material um, across a boundary. As a homeowner, what do I do that brings carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus into my home through my choices? And how does the waste product leave my home through sewage, through waste, or through general air and, and land emissions? How big is your household flux? According to these researchers, it depends on the choices you make. Let's look at two Twin Cities households to see how their choices affect their household flux. First, meet Bill, Erica, and Kristen, three young adults living together in a three-bedroom house. Well, I own this house, and I uh, have two roommates, and they help uh, pay the expenses. I like hanging out with my roommates, and we, we eat together and um, cook together and things like that as well. One of the advantages and disadvantages to having three adults living in a house is that um, we share each other's company, um, but that also means that we share the space. So it's you know sharing the refrigerator, it's sharing the bathroom, um, it's sharing the common areas. So it's something that we have to compromise on. I think compared to the average household, I think we're we're pretty good about uh, producing not very much waste. Um, we recycle and are good about reusing um, plastic and paper bags, for example. I probably have the farthest commute. I commute about eight or nine miles to downtown St. Paul, and I drive every day. I usually drive to work, but I do bus sometimes. I travel a lot, and I think this is the biggest contributor to my carbon footprint, is I, this past year I've flown a lot of miles. Research shows that some choices and behaviors have a bigger impact than others. Take air travel, for instance. What we found is that the flows of material were very disproportionate, which means that a few people use a lot of carbon and most people used a lot less. So for air travel, for example, about 20% of the people, a small part of the population, accounted for about 80% of the uh, CO2 emissions associated with air travel. Meet Ross and Betsy, and their two daughters, Eliza and Maggie. All four live in a 1,000 square foot house. We live in a small house. Uh, there are four of us in this house. We have two cars. Uh, in terms of our energy consumption in the house, and I think we deal with fairly average temperatures in the house. We try to do a lot of cooking here, and we also have a vegetable garden, which the girls really like to help with and we expanded it this year and have root vegetables out back which are still growing. So I guess there's this sort of balance between us trying to make you know, this small house work for the four of us, but not trying to drive each other crazy. But at the same time, there's less to maintain. You know, there's, there is less energy use, you know, there's, and there is that kind of uh, the camaraderie <laughs> that comes with you know, the spatial implications. But we also are really, really thinking about a tiny house with one bathroom and two teenage daughters. <laughs> so it's I'm moving into the garage. <laughs> <laughs> Many things, from the size of our household to our choice of transportation to our landscaping habits, can have an impact on the air, land, and water around us. How do your choices affect your household flux? 